Hello, everyone. This is Will. Welcome to the Int Mini Cameron Advanced Hangouts. I forget which one it is. It's uh, 10 or something. I don't remember. I'll look it up. Uh, anyway, today we have a special guest, Evan, and another special guest, me. And uh, we're the only people who showed up, which is fine. We've been talking for like an hour. <laughs> anyway. uh, but I, I've been thinking a lot, and actually Evan's been thinking a lot also. I'd be curious, maybe we can talk about some of your ideas too. Uh, certainly we've been talking about them back and forth for a while. We need to co you know, collect these and collate the ideas. Um, but we think about possible interface ideas and possible ways to build a very interesting system. Uh, not just like a, a, an IDE or editor, but maybe operating systems, maybe things like advanced uh, case computer-aided software engineering environments or things like that based on the mini Canron, relational interpreter, Barlamanish type technologies or extensions to it or, or a super Barlamin or whatever, what would these things mean? And for me at least, part of the inspiration has been I, I gave a, a brief uh, demo of Barlamin at HARC um, in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. I uh, got some good feedback there. Also, uh, just having lots of conversations with Evan and Michael and Greg and a whole bunch of other people. Um, and also looking at the work of people like Brett Victor or looking at the work of Alan Borning and you know these sort of interactive, highly interactive systems or systems with visualization capabilities and those sorts of things. So. Um, anyway, we've been thinking about this quite a bit, and so on Friday, I sat down and spent a couple hours writing up some some of the notes. Um, we really do need to try to collect all this information in some way because we've got, you know, Google chat windows full of ideas and emails and stuff like that. So we need to. That's another issue. Some sort of way to organize knowledge. I'm still very disgusted that I, extremely disgusted and disappointed that I don't have a system that I consider worth a damn for organizing all the information I have. I mean that in the strongest possible terms. Kind of online system, one might say. <laughs> yes, an online system. Yes, we need to, to get NLS uh, running on Squeak. Who knows, maybe they already have it. Uh, yeah, something like an LS would be cool. All the wiki solutions I've tried, I've become, they've made me uh, disgruntled. I want to find a system that's going to make me gruntled. Anyway, uh, that's that's a different, a different topic, and that's something I want to work on at some point. But uh, for right now, let's talk about interface ideas or uh, so here are some ideas for, for what I'll call super Barlamin. Super Barlamin, okay. Um, and super Barlamin is, well, okay, so something I have in mind, I'm, I'm just reading, you know, sort of paraphrasing from notes I have. Um, so so Al Alex Worth has a thing he calls the the best scheme, uh, the best prolog debugger in the world, or something like that, um, for tracing prolog. So here's like the ultimate scheme editor. Let's think of it that way, at least for my purposes, okay, and and maybe for others programming. And what I'll call the Indiana style, the Indiana University style, or the Dan style. Um, so heavy on interpreters, program transformations using higher order functions, things like that. Uh, the the other thing about this style is. So, so, so you know, maybe more of the Dan style than the Indiana style. But um, one thing I'll say is, is maybe a little different than, say, the racket style, is that even though there might be uses of macros, the uses of macros is maybe more limited. You, you might have a few macros that are really important, um, and maybe they're complicated, but you're not going to be building you know towers of DSLs 20 levels deep they're just full of macros they're really you know 
doing super sophisticated things all over the place. Um, so in other words, it's a little, you, even though we're in scheme, we're in a restricted scheme where macros are uh, kind of de-emphasized or where when you write a macro, you'd be willing, you know, you, you write a macro rarely enough where you would actually be willing to write it, to add it to say the relational interpreter or something like that. Um, so we, we'll sidestep the macro thing, uh, maybe by adding new special forms to the interpreter itself, or, or that sort of trick. Or we'll have to figure out how to handle macros. Like you know, we, we don't really have a way of handling macros in Varlamin. That's one part of Scheme we just can't handle. We could we could also do the work of a relational macro expander, maybe using something like nominal logic to handle the gensim or, or renaming issues, uh, the hygiene issues. Um, I'm not sure. So, so let's kind of sidestep that for right now. That's that's research. Uh, maybe we can do it, but that's still research. So we'll say we'll we'll, we'll just de-emphasize the macros for now. We'll assume that you could add special forms to the interpreter by hand, and you just don't have that many. Okay. So that, and we also have some restricted language. So, so one way to look at it is if you want to think about it from an educational standpoint, maybe it's like a racket uh, language level. You know, you have some sort of beginner level um, where you have a restricted subset of of scheme or racket, maybe you don't include call CC or delimited continuations. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't include set bang or vectors or whatever. Maybe you have a limited language. So, so there's sort of the teaching or pedagogical version of this, and there's also uh, sort of the research programming in what I call the Dan style, which is the idea that you're going to write something very, very simple that would easily run in say R5 RS scheme restricted version of scheme and you're going to write, you know maybe write a little paper on it uh, maybe a pearl or an idea paper or maybe you're going to write a little book on this code okay so uh, the code from from the re reason schemer other than the macros kind of fits in this vein I mean we, we use vectors to represent variables but that's it you know we could use tag lists as well or if you look at micro Canron, you know, uh, Jason and Dan's system. I've actually implemented micro Canron in Barlaman. I, I translate it to run in Barlaman, that works. Um, I use tag, tag lists to, to represent vectors, you know, or to, to be the equivalent of vectors representing, uh, you know, variables, that kind of thing. So anyway, we're, we're talking about a restricted version of language, uh, and what could we do with that? You know, sort of, so what might the vis vision be with this restricted language? Um, Okay, so I think the main idea, I think the main idea here is, um, okay, so why, why don't I like, say, using Emacs? That's, that's maybe the sort of the gist of it. I've got a whole bunch of, of smaller ideas as well, but you know, what is it that, I have the main complaint about, and then you know, I, I did a hangout with Alex, and at the end of it, I was giving some demos. He's like, "Well, you know, I'm a little disappointed you're using Emacs," and I had to think about that a little bit. It's like, why? Why would he be disappointed in use Emacs? Um, and now I think I understand better, and that was really good feedback. So I appreciate that. Um, and and at some point, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe this is much more like the Brett Victor or, or visualization type things. Um, so we want to visualize this. We want to visualize what's going on in the computation. And I, I do think that that's a valuable thing to do. Uh, as far as I can tell, a lot of the work going on at Hark, for example, is very much about visualizing the computation in different ways. Or, or as Brett Victor says, uh, pro programming without the blinders. Uh, and so I think that's an important line of research. That's not really why I don't like using Emacs. Uh, for 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 the sort of say research programming, I'm trying to explore an idea. The reason I really don't like using something like Emacs or any of the ed other editors I've used, including structured editors or structured editing modes, is that <clears throat> the level of editing is at the you know is at the wrong level of abstraction. So. 
when I'm actually programming uh, in Scheme, after spending many years programming in Scheme, the way I think about programming is, is not at the expression level or at the identifier level or any of those sorts of things. So if I'm using you know, something like par edit, and it, I could slurp in, you know, par edit is this like structured editing mode for, for Emacs. People are always telling me, hey, you need to use par edit. I've tried using par edit. I don't like par edit. <clears throat> um, I, find, I find it somewhat awkward to use, but, but the real reason I don't particularly like it is it doesn't really match the way you think about programming. So you can do things like slurp in an expression, and you know, there are all sorts of structured things you can do that are basically moving parentheses around inside and out. Or you can swap S expressions. That's something I do in my mode. Um, you can make sure you're not making parentheses mistakes. That's a nice feature, and so forth. And, th and those are all useful features. It's not that I, I have anything against those features. But the problem I have is that this is the equivalent of programming at machine level, you know, you know, an assembly or something like that. It is very, very low level of abstraction. Um, whereas the mental processes I have are at a much higher level of abstraction. And, and I think the best way to see this is you know, if you were to record a conversation between two really experienced schemers um, who are doing pair programming or maybe talking over the phone. right? So I'd have conversations with Dan where Dan would call me up with an idea. And he's like, hey, you know, try this out. I've got a new idea for how to fix this problem with the code or whatever. And we would have this shorthand that we had developed uh, over a long period of time. I mean, Dan Dan had his own shorthand when I started working with him, of course, because he's been doing this far longer than I have. But we've also developed sort of our own shorthand for Mini Cameron and so forth. And so, so Dan has shorthand things like left, left, lambda. That means left parenthesis, left parenthesis, lambda, which is a direct application of a lambda expression, or which would be equivalent to like a let, uh, but with an anonymous function. So he's got little uh, expressions like that. So he just says left, left, lambda, and bam, I know what to type. Um, that's still at a fairly low level. But there are other things he'll say, or we'll say to each other. And I was trying to think, you know, what would what would a conversation between us sound like if we were just pair programming? And you know, so here here's like a rough imaginary transcript. I didn't really capture the the full spirit of it, but I, Hopefully this gives some of the idea, you know. So, so, uh, so if Dan's giving instructions to me, he might say something like that: like define a function foo of two arguments. Okay, the first argument is a list; the second's a number. Pattern match. Okay, well, we're going to use pattern matching, or we're going to use p match. Just say we're going to use p match. Okay, well, immediately I know that we're pattern matching on the list, not the number, because if we're using Arabic numerals, it doesn't make sense to pattern match on a number. So I know. We're using pmatch. I know to import or load the pmatch library or the macro. Um, I know that we're pmatching on the list. So if we're just pmatching a list and treating it as a pair, then we have the empty list or the pair case. If if the list, if if he said instead that you know uh, the first argument is an expression, then I know from context which sort of expression it is. Is it a lambda expression? Is it a scheme expression? Is it a mini canron expression? If it's a mini canron expression. Then I know that core mini Canron has equal, condi, fresh. Uh, we may or may not include run. Uh, you know, we may or may not include the extended constraints like absento and you know sabalo and numbero. So I know to pattern match against that. And this, of course, is something that's nice if you have abstract um, data types and exhaustive pattern matching in the language with the. Uh, with those, that sort of type system, then you can get this sort of thing for free. But, but anyway, the point is, uh, if I know the type of expression we're matching on, and I know we're pattern matching, then I immediately know how to fill out a whole bunch of structure. And there's also things like, you know, okay, there are two base cases, maybe. Um, you might say something like that. And maybe, maybe we're using a con instead of pattern matching. He might say there are two base cases. Okay. And he might say that, you know, for the recursive case, it's something like, it's natural recursion. That means it's not tail recursive. It's natural recursion. It's going to have some operator on the outside of the recursion. And there's a whole bunch of set of rules about, you know, if you have a recursive call, you're probably, you know, if you're if you're recurring over a list, you're you're going to be taking the coder of the list. Any arguments that you haven't done a test against, you probably aren't changing. There's a whole bunch of kind of 
you know, rules of thumb that, that usually work. Uh, and then they might say, now make it deeply recursive. So that means we are going to recur over trees, not just flat lists, which means we're going to add another case. Uh, if we're recurring over a list, uh, we're going to add another case where we're going to check to see if the first thing in the list is a pair. And if so, we are going to recur on the car, or the cutter, car and the cutter of the list and then combine those results in some obvious way, you, either if they're lists using cons or append, or if they're numbers using maybe plus or times or whatever. So, so just like a tiny bit of shorthand, uh, he can convey a ton of information to me. And now I know largely what the structure of the program is. And then he might say, uh, now made it, make it variadic. OK, so, so how do you make it variadic? Variadic means it takes any number of arguments. Well, the standard way, the standard recipe that Dan taught me to make it variadic is you write a helper function that's variadic. It's like lambda x you know, without parentheses around the x. That means it's variadic. And then you call the helper function. So you call a helper function that passes in x as a list. And then you just recur over a list in the standard way. So as soon as he says variadic, I know I need a helper function. That function is going to be variadic. And it's, or sorry, the driver function is going to be variadic. The driver um, is going to call the function I'm currently defining, which is actually now going to be the helper function. So I need to rename it. And I probably want to put it inside of a let rec to, to not pollute the namespace, or I want to put it in a module or a library or something like that. Uh, and then you might say CPS it. OK, now we're going to do a, a continuation passing style transformation. And then you might say, now registerize it or trampoline it or whatever. So I'm going to do another trans transformation. And so that's how we really write code. It's much more like that. I mean, this is sort of an amalgam of a bunch of different examples. But we we talk in this shorthand, and we, we also often operate at the level of correctness preserving transformations or on sort of structural information. Uh, like, OK, make it deeply recursive. OK, so I know I know what to do to make it deeply recursive. There's some knowledge I don't have. I don't know necessarily how to combine the, the results. OK, that might require a little thinking. But the structure of adding deep recursion is, is usually pretty obvious what to do. And so what I would like is an editor. Uh, and, and we can take a step back. I mean, this doesn't have to have anything to do with mini Cameron or Barlamin or, or whatever. OK, so, so I was just like a scheme editor that lets me program at that level of abstraction. And, and I thought about doing this many years ago, actually, when I was at Indiana still. Um, I started, in fact, the first time I learned uh, uh, any sort of programming in a, uh, on the Mac uh, on, on OS X was for Objective-C. I learned Objective-C a little bit just so I could write this editor. And uh, I think it was. Kind of daunting in size, and I didn't I didn't have all the ideas I have now. Um, and we also didn't have something like Parliament that you know uh, could sort of push it over the top, and make it really interesting. But anyway, that's that's what I want to see in a scheme editor. I want to have all these transformations available, and I want I want the editor to to be able to have a, a, an interface that, in some sense, would simulate my pair programming or giving instructions to, to Dan or Dan giving the instructions to me or, you know, so, so talking to someone else who has a similar notion of shorthand and who has a similar notion of these kind of structural things that you do in scheme programming. Because that's, that's how I actually program the scheme and that's how I think about programming a scheme. E even if I uh, am not pair programming, I'm going through the same pro thought process. Uh, I'm just not saying it out loud. So I would like to have some sort of interface where I can make these transformations, I can I can do these things at a very high level, and in fact, maybe even have a verbal interface. You know, going back to something like uh, MIT's Programmer Apprentice, Programmer's Apprentice. In fact, I just ordered the MIT Press book on Programmer's Apprentice and read up on that some more. Um, but but I, I hope you can see that this is a much higher level of abstraction than something like Par Edit, right? You know. Parrot's fine. I don't have anything wrong with the structured editor. In fact, I would like to be able to do structured editing. But I also want to be able to have this, these higher levels of abstractions. OK, so I want, to, I want to be able to say you know, verbally to the editor, left, left, lambda. And it's like, bam, it fills it in, knows what it is. Or it knows that left, left, lambda, and a let 
you know, we can we can go between those, right? And so those sorts of transformations. Or uh, there's a whole bunch of things about inlining. You know, so so Shea Scheme has this thing called CP0, which is this compiler pass that does all sorts of inlining and optimizations. When Dan and I are writing code, uh, we often go back and forth. Hey, Orchid. Uh, we often go back and forth, and we will look at a piece of code, and we'll do a whole bunch of variants of the code to try to make the code cleaner, right? Or something like that. Or maybe we'll decide, hey, maybe we actually want to curry this function, or partially curry, or whatever. So I want to be able to say curry or uncurry, you know, either verbally or uh, through through a keyboard interface or through some buttons or whatever it is. And in fact, the system should be predictive. It should notice that given the structure of the code I have, that certain certain optimizations can be done. And this is also an opportunity to do learning. You know, so you could have a system that learns and maybe suggests certain optimizations, or maybe on the side window would show you, hey, here's here's an optimization you could do, and here's what the code would look like if you did that right now. So you could see sort of multiple versions of your code. Right? Here's here's the current version of code, here's it CPS, here's it, you know, CPS and registerize, whatever. And uh, you know, ideally, you could do sort of bidirectional programming where you could look at one of these views and you could go into that view and change that view, and then it would change the direct style as well, that kind of thing. So it'd figure out how to undo the conver uh, undo the code. So you could be looking at multiple variants of your code at the same time. Um, I think that would be really powerful. And so if you're going to CPS the code, you know, CPSing is great, and it's like the gateway drug to program transformations. But at the same time. You know, reading CPS code can be harder than reading direct style code. So maybe what you really want to do is say, hey, I eventually want CPS code, registerized code, CPS trampoline code, whatever it is, and I want to see views of the, what that code would look like in real time. But I'm going to write the direct style code because I'm still adding cases to this interpreter that I'm going to CPS, for example. right? So, um, so you're kind of keeping this in lockstep. And at some point, you're like, OK, I'm done with the direct style stuff. Now I need to start playing around with the CPS version. Uh, so that I think would be a really cool capability as well. Uh, so Orchid, we're I'm just uh, going over some some notes I have I, I came up with on Friday for an idea for an advanced um, an advanced editor for a subset of Scheme, you know, sort of like a super super editor. Um, some of these ideas are related to things like Barlamin, some of them are not, uh, and so so anyway. Um, I started thinking about what are the levels of, of abstraction that you might have in an editor or a system like this. I mean, calling it an editor at this point is maybe maybe not quite the right term. Um, but you could have so, several levels of abstraction. So a few of the levels of abstraction that I thought about is one is at the expression level, so you're like slurping or swapping S expressions or you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's that's what you would get from a, just a standard structured editor. Transformations and refactoring, things like continuation passing style, uh, threading um, um, an, ar uh, an argument through monadically, that's something we often do. Or transforming the code to be in monadic style. Uh, and, and some of this may require user intervention in certain places, but the system could be as smart as it can be. So you know, right now, if you have a lot of code and you want to thread an argument through monadically, um, you know, there's, there's a little bit of pain and it's a little bit error prone. I mean, and, and you know, it just it just takes time. And it's like, all right, well, now I'm going to spend you know 10 minutes doing that. Uh, and instead, I just want to say, hey, bam, add this, and then maybe the system will ask me about a couple places where it's not sure what to do, or maybe it'll ask me for the name of the function or the name of the argument I want or whatever. But I shouldn't be doing that by hand. It should should be getting computer assistance. Um, or trampolining or registerization. Registerization, uh, that's a transformation that's like very error prone. It's very easy to mess that up. So that's something I would like. And like once again, I would like to be able to see, here's the direct style. Here's the CPS. Here's CPS plus registerized. I'd like to be able to see all those views together and be able to edit. You know, certainly the views that are that are pre-transformation. If not, maybe be able to edit the transform views and have that feedback. Um, another level, you know, thinking thinking even a higher level than that, uh, you have things like the algorithm level. 
you know. So, and this is starting to get into the viewpoint of something like the Programmer's Apprentice. Um, and and if you haven't looked at the Programmer's Apprentice work, I think that that works very interesting. But uh, one of the things I might want to do is say, okay, I want to sort this argument at this point, uh, or sort this variable at this point, or what you know, the, the, sort the contents of this variable. This variable is bound to a list, and I want to sort it, and I want a stable sort. So I say, hey, all right, a stable sort L at this point. And the system is going to show me the, the stable sorting algorithms it knows and information about them, like asymptotic complexity or constant factors or whatever it is. And I can just pick which one I want. And if I want to go back, I could swap that out, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's that's the sort of thing that you could do with, with Programmer's Apprentice. Or, or you could say, here is the data structure I want. And in fact, if you're doing this research programming type thing, you know, what are re data representations for numbers, for example? Well, there's Arabic numerals, scheme, scheme numbers. There's also piano numerals. So like, you know, zero, zero would be represented maybe as a symbol Z and, and then successor of Z. You know, maybe the pair S dot Z and then S dot S dot Z, you know, that kind of thing. Or you have piano numerals. That's something we often use in, in uh, sort of theoretical computer science because you can pattern match on the structure or decompose the structure. So uh, that allows you to recur on things. And for certain operations, just incrementing and, and decrementing efficient in terms of uh, in terms of those operators. You might use what we call OLIG numbers from chapter seven and eight of the reason schema, where we have these little Indian binary lists. Uh, that could be a representation. You might have church encodings of numerals, where you're encoding the the uh, the numeral as a lambda term. And it'd be great to have an editor where I could see, you know, sort of a representation of a concrete numeral, you know, number like five, right? So I have five on the screen as an Arabic five, but it has like these kind of square square scare quote, and uh, that that means that that's that's a representation of five. And I could swap out what the representation is, right? And I could you know, just tell the system, hey, bam, I want that to be piano, right? And now it knows what operators there are over piano. And if it if it's something like multiplications involved, then it's like, hey, do you really want to do multiplication on piano? You're not just doing successor and, and, and you know, successor and uh, predecessor. Uh, or it's like, hey, we got Oleg numbers, or hey, we've got, you know, uh, church encodings or whatever it is and it will know like if we do church encodings how to do multiplication on church encodings or whatever and you could also have other data structures of course you know trees or um you know we could get into uh, more complicated things like hash tables that that might be a little too much of a language to begin with but you know so ultimately you could have different sort of data structures and, and in a program as apprentice you could you could tell the system hey i need a data structure that has this asymptotic performance, or that has, you know, this performance for these operations supports these operations with this performance, and, and the system could suggest to you what it knows, and then you can just pick it out, pick out which version you want to use, that kind of thing. Uh, so, so that sort of behavior is is another level of abstraction, or designing an algorithm. You know, you could maybe use help designing an algorithm, saying like, hey, I need to create a fixed point algorithm. Or you could do things like, um, hey, I need to memoize this function. Or if you're in Minicanron, I want to table this function, that sort of thing. But I want to memoize this function, or I want to use uh, incremental programming you know, on this function, that kind of thing. Maybe something like Adapton. Um, and you know, so, so a whole bunch of things there. You could also have, by the way, in the editor, you also have things like autocomplete. I'm not exactly sure where that goes. That goes somewhere. Uh, I mean, that's related to expression level, but that also autocomplete, like a super autocomplete, um, can tie into the the syntax of the language, um, the types if you're in a type context, the uh, you know s some semantic information, which which very which identifiers are bound in the current environment, but also, you know, like in our relational interpreters, if you have tests or if you have properties. You could actually do a value-based uh, autocomplete where it's filtering out answers uh, based on 
um, which tests would pass in this context and things like that. So you could do some super autocomplete. You know, getting performance uh, down could be a challenge, but I can imagine a super autocomplete where you know you start typing some characters, like as a procedure call. Like you're starting to type, you know, the name of a function you're calling, and then this drop down comes down, and then you know, over time, maybe over a second or two, it starts like slashing out, you know, or, or you know, striking through the completions that semantically wouldn't work. And you can mouse over those completions that it wouldn't work, and it will point you to the tests or the properties that would fail or whatever it is. Um, and, it, and at that level, it might be worth your while as a programmer to wait the second or two to get that additional information if you're not sure how to proceed. So that, that would be interesting to have sort of this incremental um, autocomplete, where parts of it are super fast, but then it's also going to, to be a little smart and try to, to strike out things that, that won't work there. And may, maybe you could do some caching or uh, memoization that would, would help with that as well to help increase performance or tabling or whatever. Uh, then you also have things like the architecture level. You know, that's a higher level of abstraction. So now that's the architecture for the entire, the entire program. And so, you know, how, how would we want to specify the architecture for, for, for a program? You know, if you're doing something really small, um, you know, when this Dan kind of fits on one or two pages of code type thing, maybe the architecture thing, maybe the architectural level is not as important. Um, but, but even then, it's sort of like, hey, here are some functions I need. Here are some helpers. Here are arguments I want to thread through, right? So that helps you a little bit in terms of tying all the pieces together. Um, but you, know, you could have end-to-end -end testing could be helpful. That, that could help at sort of the architectural level. Uh, but if, if you're really going to be serious about large programs, then you want something probably more like Programmer's Apprentice, where you're talking large-scale architecture, and maybe, you know, one thing you could do at a minimum is capture requirements or intent, which is something Programmer's Apprentice uh, would do, is that you, know, you could say why you're making design decisions. So you can associate metadata with your program or your code, or, or you could associate design documents with your code. Um, so imagine you know, we're programming Dan style, and we're writing you know, some beautiful code for a Perl or for a book or something. We could be capturing you know, sort of in, well, I, I don't even want to say which style. Uh, but we could be capturing the information that we'd be writing up later. Or, or we could be partly writing, you know, sort of, sort of a, an assisted literate programming thing. But, but we're making maybe a clear separation between the code and, and the documentation. But anyway, you'd be capturing these requirements and maybe writing some of the documentation, but then tying the documentation closely to the actual code. So if the code changes, then you know maybe the documentation has to be updated or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, the Programmer's Apprentice project had all sorts of ways of capturing intent and why you're making certain design decisions, what the trade-offs are, what alternative design decisions would be. Uh, that could be really interesting. And at the architectural level, you could also imagine if you're doing something bigger, you know, how would you really architect a system? Well, if you're doing in Lisp, you might build the first one bottom up and then after that top down. But you're going to have a whiteboard, or you're going to have diagrams, or you know, if you're in Java, you're going to have something like UML, or if you're in Eiffel, you're going to use Bone, uh, the business object notation, or whatever it is. So you're going to have higher level ways of talking about the structure of your code, and you might be talking at the module level. You might be talking at interfaces. You might be also capturing use cases with uh, interactions between the users and the systems. You know, all those sorts of things that, that come up. Um, and how exactly that ties into which algorithms you use, I'm not sure. Um, but, but anyway, this is an area where people have made a lot of, a lot of effort in the uh, Programmer's Apprentice project, for example, and also where traditional case tools come in. Uh, so anyway, so something that I haven't really thought too much about the architectural level, but that's something that'd be interesting. Um, there's also other types of transformations I haven't talked about. Like, you know, if you're writing lots of interpreters, you know, something you often do is you're going between big step uh, interpreters and small step 
uh, rewrite systems. You know, you might might have you know, CE machines or CEK machines or CESK machines. Um, you might be going back and forth between these things. Uh, you know, so you could have a system if that if that's your bread and butter. You might have that uh, or or these rewrite rule system type things going on. And you could also have um, Uh, I forget, but I will. It's in here somewhere. Um, yeah, so so you can have all those sorts of things. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh yeah, another thing that's that's kind of interesting is uh, when when I'm pair programming with Dan, he would also say something like, uh, "Okay, now do the obvious thing," right? And so do the obvious thing is a is, is a statement that's contextual. And do the obvious thing means different things in different contexts, but that means we're sort of like we've gotten to the point where it's obvious how to fill in all the rest of the details, and that's probably something where it's like between heuristics and a little bit of higher level like kind of analysis of the code and program synthesis, you should be able to just like click a button to like, do the right thing. And once again, you could have kind of a, a little pane that you know here's your code, here's the definitions you're working on or whatever, and here's like the little pane. That shows you if you click the do the right thing button, here's what do the right thing would do, and maybe a high level uh, English description of hey, do the right thing in this case means you know finish the pattern matches and uh, you know pass this test by CPS again. I don't know what it is. Um, I have to think a little bit, and part of this is sort of we'd have to capture uh, sort of the interactions between. Schemers to, to actually see when they use these phrases like do the right thing uh, But but that would be really cool to have a do the right thing button which sort of like uh, You know uh, cock has this crush tactic uh, And for or actually Adam Chopala has created this crush thing for cock and that's I guess a little uh, Maybe a little different in spirit, but the same sort of idea. It's like at some point you should be able to say do the right thing, and it should use kind of its knowledge of scheme and semantics and heuristics and synthesis and all that to just kind of fill in the rest. Um, it should support uh, pair programming, so you should be able to use this interface to pair program, especially like on online. You know, so you should be able to pair program with someone else remotely. Um, and it should support this this uh, style of interaction. So it's not just talking to the computer. You should also have, you know, two or more humans be able to do the same thing. And maybe you need like CRDTs to reconcile differences or whatever it is. Um, okay. And another. Oh yeah. Okay. So so there are other things. That obviously, you know, we could fit the Barlman type things in for refutation or synthesis. There's also, you know, maybe you want to have uh, abstract interpretation, taint flow, that kind of thing, auto repair. Um, you might also, you know, want to have something like uh, recurrence relations associated with the code to tell you the recurrent, the running time, that kind of thing, and maybe send that to a solver. Uh, you might want to be able to talk at the interface boundary level between like different modules or or uh, libraries, and you have contracts and preconditions and postconditions and all that type of thing, or something like closure spec. Um, you know, another language that might be interested to do this in would be Haskell, because Haskell supports uh, equational reasoning and some sorts of transformations that we can't really do in Scheme, and also that doesn't have macros, right? So that, that would also be an interesting thing. Uh, I think it's almost it. Let's see. Let me just check the rest of my notes. I got one or two more comments. Yeah, okay. So the, the only other comments um, I have are, you know, once again, this is uh, coming from conversations with Evan, but. You know, Alan Kay has these criteria. Apparently, they used at Xerox Park and developing things like the Alto, which was, you know, you want to use the tool yourself, 
Um, and that's important. You know, so we don't really use Barlamin. So that, that was what we started thinking about is why, why don't we use Barlamin ourselves? Um, and what would what would be required to make, you know, what, what what changes would we have to make Barlamin to make Barlamin, you know, be good enough to replace, say, Emacs uh, for for our day to day scheme programming for at least some tasks, if not every task. Uh, so that's that's one question we started asking ourselves. And one is, you know, I started doing some uh, scalability experiments, and I found that uh, Barlamin is not not very fast once you have enough definitions. Even just loading the file, just the parsing seems to take a long time. So we probably just need a better for a parser. We need a better parser for error messages anyway. That parser doesn't even necessarily have to be written in, in Mini Canron, um, depending on how we do it. But anyway, it could probably do a much faster parser, maybe also, you know, if we have D Canron, we could do some of those things. And and Greg, I think, is also looking at uh, some improvements we could make to this the speed of the interpreter and the parser and that kind of thing. Uh, so, so scalability, like how how big how big uh, can we handle? Like, you know, how, how big a chunk of code can we handle? How many definitions? And you know, I found that um, once we started getting into you know even six or seven helpers, uh, that really slowed down certain synthesis tasks. It didn't slow down refutation. We could have like 20, 20 functions, uh, and refutation was still the same speed. It was quite fast. But if you want to do anything synthesis-wise, what seemed to be happening was you know the environment's getting bigger and bigger. So now the synthesis task has more and more possible choices, and and also you know it sort of fell off a cliff. It's probably exponential type behavior where it's like, yeah, it works okay with five definitions, but you go to six and now it's like really slow. You go to seven and you know, it takes minutes. That kind of thing. Uh, so, so Greg has some ideas for that, but scalability obviously is one of the things. And you know, maybe synthesis is something we really have to be restrictive about. Um, but maybe we can do, you know, refutation over large code bases, or maybe we can just find out how to make this uh, faster. I'm not sure. So anyway, use the tool yourself. So scalability is one of them. The interface sucks. The Barlamin it's really just like a prototype of an idea. So we'd have to come up with better interface. Um, and you know the the subset of languages hang, handles isn't gigantic, so we either have to do encoding tricks. And I was able to get uh, microcanron to work in in Barlamin, but I had to to do some annoying transformations that you know probably at least some of those we could just add to Barlamin, add, add a little more language support and make it a little less painful. Um, now, of course, the other thing is, you know, if you wanted to use the tool to bootstrap itself. That seems a little tricky with Barlamin because Barlamin's partly written in Swift. So we don't really have any way to do GUI programming right now in Mini Canron. So one way to handle it, and just, I mean, is we're not going to use Barlamin anytime soon to, to edit Swift code. So one way to do it might be to have a high level declarative, succinct DSL for doing GUI type things or for managing processes, that kind of thing. And then we can use, you know, we we could write uh, you know a version of Barlamin at that level uh, using this, and that, that would be nice anyway because then it'd be a lot easier to to experiment with different uh, designs for Barlamin. Right now, it's really a pain to go in and change the Swift code, um, and also then potentially it'd be something we could edit in in uh, in Barlamin. We wouldn't be able to edit necessarily all the underlying stuff because maybe turns into Swift code eventually or something. I don't know, but or, or calls out the Swift code. Um, but like, we could do something there. Yeah. I feel like Barlamin very particularly stands to benefit hugely from some thought into the sort of graphical interface, in particular because like things that are missing from most of the environments and just kind of that I normally program in that I kind of would love to have, but you know, it's on my sort of you know, list of things to do never because there will never be enough time. But uh, is is things like okay, well, I'm writing this function, and uh, you know, I have tests for this function. I have tests that include this function. I have documentation over here, and kind of navigating between all of those things is like frequently a pain. It's like they're in different files at different places in the file. If I'm using a files type thing, uh, and you know, not only is sort of you know with a, a you know 
and there probably exist more well thought out interfaces for these that I just don't haven't you know haven't you know come into my sphere. But uh, but not only would you know better interfaces for those things be nice in general, but because Barlam in particular has such a so much more to gain from things like effective ways to integrate, move between, and express uh, test cases and, and constraints in various things. I feel like you know being able to say, okay, you know, defining a function here's the you know the test cases for it. Here are some constraints for it. Here's another function. Kind of moving between those things, you know, as an interface concern. While you're doing that, you can have Varlamin running in the background trying to satisfy the things you've already specified while you're specifying something else. So it feels like there's like a huge amount to gain in terms of what it could do as an interface for programming from really solving some of those things that you sort of, you can't use it that way right now because you kind of have one set of test cases and one set of functions and they're little, you know, it's not a, a great deal of flexibility there. So, so I think that that something with you know, how the interface and how the workflow of using Barlamin stands to, to really benefit a lot. Uh, that's a good point. And, and also, you know, something you said about writing some code and then have Barlamin, having Barlamin do its thing, you know, if you, if you had sort of more of a modular level division, right, you could, you know, often when I'm uh, programming, I, I know some of the details, but I don't know all the details. So maybe I'm going into a module and I'm writing part of the code, and now I'm not sure what to do. So I go back into the other module and I write part of the code. But like you said, while I'm in the second module, the first module, you, you can be running a bunch of tasks in parallel trying to ref refute or synthesize or whatever. And, and at that point, you don't particularly care about interactivity. So maybe that's that makes it a little easier, right? Or, or breaking things down by module means that hopefully you get more scalability because now you only have to talk about interfaces. You don't have to talk about the rest of it, right? So, so that's part of the problem is like right now, if you don't have any namespace control, then you know every possible helper function you have is something that you have to worry about when you're doing census. Whereas if, if you're really careful about what you put in the namespace, then you avoid that problem. And it's also you know, one of the things we kind of have talked about in the past. Also, the case where the whole you know potentially, if Barlamin is kind of being proactive about you know so, you know trying to make amendments to various elements of your tests and your code and your constraints and everything, then you know like for example, if I'm writing tests for something I'm writing in you know whatever else I'm writing, like I write a test. And then I write another test, maybe write a few more tests, then I go like program something or write whatever. It's like potentially after I've written that first test, maybe Barlman comes up with a candidate function, suggests more tests, and I have a bit of an interaction there, just like selecting tests, and then it kind of takes it the rest of the way, you know. So where it's like having it able to intervene at that level, saying, Okay, you you thought you were doing writing tests, but let's take a look at this code I just came up with next to your tests and have some have some dialogue about what you've specified so far and maybe suggest a few places to go with that, having more control over that interface rather than having them be kind of in two separate parts of the editor is I think gonna be really important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And and you know when you're talking about these tests, uh, that also reminds me that um, you know, if you're if you ask Barlamin, you know, say you ask Super Barlamin, hey, CPS this code, then one of the things it should do is also CPS all the tests as well. And and there are also things you can do like uh, you can feed in an identity continuation if your code is CPS correctly. If you feed in an identity continuation, you know, if it gets called twice. Instead of once, usually that means your definition is wrong, or I mean, at least in certain contexts. Now, of course, if the if the CPS is automatic, that's fine. But if, but if you get any sort of manual intervention or some of the code you're not sure of, you know, th there may be things like that that um, you can use to, or the system can use to help tell if you're like kind of on the wrong track. Um, but yeah, like you know, we should be thinking also, of course, in terms of. What tests we have, what properties, which contracts, which boundaries we have between different modules, and trying all those things in the background all the time. And, and you know, I guess uh, another LMK idea is that 
you know, you can essentially live in the future by buying expensive hardware. And we don't have to buy the hardware. We could try, you know, running on an Amazon X1 instance that has 100 hardware threads and, you know, you live 20 years in the future, or however many years it is. Um, you know, maybe, maybe laptops will have that in, I, I don't know how many years laptops will have that in. But anyway, you know, we, we can do that sort of thing where we're saying, all right, well, maybe right the second is still too slow, but if you had access to some big memory machine with tons and tons of threads, which is not that expensive anymore, um, then maybe maybe we can be much more speculative and interactive and things like that. Um, another another LNK idea, you know, so you you know use the tool yourself, and then the other is design it to be used by a hundred people. So it's like a forcing forcing you to scale uh, to some extent, and we've talked about this as well. And so I've been thinking about you know who who would our hundred people be, and you know, well one one thing is that there are people in Indiana who learn uh, you know, who take uh, three eleven or five twenty one. That's the grad version of three eleven. This is the programming language course that Dan taught for many years, and you know the course is taught you know in this sort of style. And so there are a bunch of grad students in Indiana who are used to scheme a racket who do these sorts of transformations. Um, so. It could be some researchers, grad students, advanced undergrads, uh, people taking PL courses, people just want to experiment uh, around with things. So, you know, uh, right there, you might get a hundred people who'd be interested in using it, uh, and then it forces you to think, okay, well, where what are the pain points, and you know, how good would the tool have to be to for them to be to make it worthwhile? And and maybe it's even the sort of thing where even if the tool was not sort of the work-a-day tool where they wanted to use it for all their programming, it might be good enough where if they're doing transformational-based programming that they would want to use the tool to do a bunch of transformations and then export the code and then do the rest of it in Vim or something. I don't know. But it, it might be that for at least certain certain parts of the programming process, uh, it's, it speeds things up so much that it'd be worthwhile. So that that's one thing I've been thinking about. Well, another thing that I've been kind of wondering about, and this is I think maybe a little further afield, maybe a little bit of a tangent relative to the kind of mainline vision, but but one that I think that's kind of interesting to at least have at the sort of back of the mind for where this stuff might end up, particularly since we've, you know, we have this whole kind of branch now of connection to kind of education and program learning, which is basically about using program synthesis to, you know, maybe it's for pedagogical reasons, maybe it's for whatever, interact with people that aren't experts, you know, computer users trying to kind of get maximal performance out of their programming routine. Uh, one of the use cases I've been thinking about is like all these people I know that are in, you know, social sciences or physics or something that need to basically hack scripts together to manage some data from their, you know, from their telescopes or from their citation networks or something like this, where they kind of, they, they know how to specify what they want in some respects, but it's, you know, an enormous amount of kind of human, Human labor goes into kind of hacking together these scripts because there's just you know a, a big mismatch between what you know the general population is prepared to do with programming and, and kind of things that a synthesis a synthesis system could potentially quite easily facilitate with some of these very basic kinds of you know just wiring up these kind of data and visualizations and things. So that's something that I've been trying to think about. If there's kind of under the broad rubric of programming without code, right? Like how how, yeah. how how much interaction and how much of the specification of the synthesis problem can be done without a kind of mental model of the underlying language in which you're synthesizing is something I've been kind of trying to think about. Yeah, that's right. And I've been talking to Greg about that too in the context of biology, for example, where um, you know people in biology write R scripts, they might write a little Python, they might use Excel a lot. Excel has, you know, Flash Fill, which is a synthesis-based uh, tool. But you know, could you could you uh, synthesize R code or Julia code or or some Python code? And this also gets back to what we talked about as you know having a semantic version of, of Smalltalk's method finder, right? Um, and uh, something something along those lines. And you know, David Nolan suggested that. We have something like an API, you know, like, like an API finder for closure might be a good good use of of the synthesis technology for 
for people who are new to clo uh, closure, trying to figure out which API calls to use. We could do something sort of like Method Finder uh, in Smalltalk. And so I can imagine a tool uh, for some specialized domain, be it biology, be it you know uh, astronomy or whatever, where you know it can help people synthesize these little scripts that they often write, uh, or help them find API calls, or maybe what you really want to do is you know even though these languages have lots of adoption, so like R is deeply embedded into work in you know biology or bioinformatics things like that, uh, and it's unlikely to be dislodged anytime soon. If you could actually create a, a, a system that was an order of magnitude or more better at productivity for, for people who aren't super programmers, um, then maybe you could actually have a somewhat different uh, language, right? So, so that maybe at some point, if, if the productivity and the confidence in the code became so much better, uh, then people would be willing to consider an alternative to R, that kind of thing. Or maybe you would get people involved who just, they're not capable of programming in R currently. They just don't know enough about uh, programming or whatever. So that'd be another, another thing to explore. And it could potentially be a kind of a hybrid universe, right? You can do some things in this, and then whatever you get out can be fed into R by someone else. And maybe you can't do what you want, but maybe you can. And even if you can't, then maybe you can kind of get part of the way, and then that's better than nothing or something like that. Yeah, and, and it could also be nice for doing things like prototyping and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's some interesting ideas there. Uh, I guess, well, so there, there was another thing I was going to mention that we've been talking about. No, I forget what it is. Too, too, many, too many ideas rattling around my head right now. But uh, uh, we were talking about all sorts of other, other ideas also. Um, but anyway, uh, th those are a few of the ideas I've thought of for, for kind of a, you know, a super, super scheme editor. Oh, yeah, also, you know, we could do this. In, you know, the editor could be written in straight scheme without the mini canron stuff, or it could be, you know, maybe in a, in a language like Mercury or Curry, uh, or like Decanran or something like that. Um, just depends on what features you want, or you know, maybe you write it in scheme and then we add some of the the Barlman like features uh, afterwards. I'm not sure, but anyway, that when I think about what you could build. I don't think it's trivial to build, but when I think about what you could build, and when I think about it, what I actually do in like Emacs, it's like pretty sad the gulf between them, right? And so, you know, from that standpoint, I don't think that any single like visualization or anything like that is is going to speed me up nearly as much as being able to do correctness preserving transformations automatically, and you know, sort of, sort of match kind of my mental model or my pair programming model. Uh, much more closely. The visualization is great. I mean, I don't want to. I, I would like that as well. I, I also want the system to be able to do the visualization, but uh, and the tracing and all that. But uh, but the main thing is I want I want the way I interact with my tools to match much more closely the the cognitive level at which I operate, or the level at which I communicate with other programmers. Uh, Orca said, I feel like an editor like this would have to be built along with a compiler. What do you think? Um, that's a good question. I think it, it's going to have to have some semantic knowledge, certainly. And you know, maybe maybe you have a hybrid world where you know you have have an interpreter, maybe not a full compiler, or a relational interpreter, or maybe we figure out how to do a relational compiler. I don't know. Uh, if you want to do things like the refutation and synthesis stuff. Or maybe we use a different approach. You know, maybe we use E3 to do synthesis like other people do. I don't know. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if it works well enough, and and we at least start with this model of we're writing Dan style code where the code fits on two pages, like that kind of thing. Maybe we can get away with doing an interpreter. We probably could, or maybe we JIT compile some of it or something. Uh, but yeah, I think you have to have some sort of semantics. Um, Build in and some ability to execute it. So you, you want a REPL as well. I didn't even mention that. You want you want a REPL. So uh, you probably want your own implementation of this language, either as a compiler or as an interpreter or as both or as a JIT, JIT compiler. I mean, a, 
yeah, JIT compiler. Um, I, I agree that you want something like that. Like you, you just, I don't know that you can get away without it. I mean, I guess what you could potentially do is if you picked a subset of of scheme and were very very careful and had exactly the same semantics in your tool as in say Shea scheme, or you hacked Shea scheme, or you know extended Shea scheme, or put some macros in Shea scheme to make Shea scheme behave the way like you want to behave, maybe you can just call out the Shea scheme, right? So maybe you embed the compiler that way, so you don't have to write it. Uh, and you might also have fast and slow modes. Like maybe if you're doing a relational interpreter, then it's like really slow. Uh, but at some point you're like, hey, I think I'm I'm ready to go. So let me just also try this at shade optimized level three and you know see how that works. Uh, so yeah, I think it's gonna that that level of integration is gonna be something you have to figure out from sort of an engineering standpoint. You know, and the other thing is like you know there there are a lot of ideas here. And we've talked about a lot of other ideas. So, you know, part of it's also trying to figure out from a design standpoint which ideas are really important. You know, how does this system, you know, fit together? So, so it, it, uh, you're getting sort of the maximum bang for the buck because you're going to have to learn how to use a tool like this. You know, if you're trying to teach a beginning programmer scheme and how to use a tool like this. I mean, I guess you want it to degrade gracefully where you know, they just end up with an editor. But, uh, but to really use it fully, you need to know about correctness preserving transformations. You need to know about all these other things. So you know, it requires some, some degree of familiarity with, with uh, you know, some, some at least medium scheme concepts or programming concepts. Uh, any other thoughts or any other counter proposals? I mean, if you had a tool like that, was this something you'd use? I was going to say, I think that also the, the really kind of important question there, right, is like what, how much of, what you know, what's the least amount of this that we could do in the shortest amount of time that would actually become the thing we use rather than, you know, yeah. still next? Yeah, and that, that's a good question. Also, like, I mean, part of it is, do we start over? Or we throw Barlman out and start over. Um, you know, I, I guess. Okay, so so what I would probably advocate is doing a little more high level exploration and design, because it's a lot easier to paper prototype things, uh, and then, you know. Try try to come up with a vision. <laughs> try to come up with a vision that uh, uh, that makes sense and that we can build on, and then decide which parts you know we want to implement uh, sooner rather than later. And so, you know, one thing we talked about implementing would be super autocomplete, and that's something we could potentially add to Barlaman right now as an exploration. Right? So, like, hey, you know, how good would autocomplete? How good an autocomplete could we build? How responsive would it feel, and could we, you know, would would that be useful? Uh, at the same time, I feel like the current version of Barlaman, right, the second has some serious limitations in the interface design and the scalability. So maybe Greg can solve some of the scalability problems, and maybe we just you know do an overhaul of the user interface design. I mean, I, I think there's like restricting yourself to six or whatever. However many uh, you know tests there are is kind of silly. The way the test stuff works is silly. The fact that you don't have a REPL is silly. The fact that you you know I mean there's a whole bunch of things like that that are just bad. We could probably get pretty far just by by making Barlman better, like improving the um, improving the parser, getting better error messages, all that stuff, right? So uh, you know that would that would be kind of the low hanging fruit way. I guess, or the incremental way is to to try to try to just build on the Barlman thing while we're thinking sort of the same time about what would we ultimately want? What would we want that'd be much more kind of aggressive than Barlman? Um, so that that seems like a reasonable way of doing it. Like, you know, let's let's fix Barlaman so it's not quite as terrible so that we could actually start using it and at the same time start thinking, you know, 
more grandly about what we'd like. So th that that'd probably be my suggested two-prong approach. We think pie in the sky and start doing this nice design for the overall system. And we start fixing up Parliament to the extent where we could actually use it. Um, I guess one question, you know, what, what do we need to fix in Parliament? Well, we obviously need to fix scalability. We need to be able to divide the code up probably into different modules so we don't have all the namespace pollution. You know, so, so programming in Parliament also means you just have to be maybe more conscientious about some things <laughs> than you would otherwise. I mean, actually, dividing the code up, you can always use LetRec to, to try to avoid uh, polluting the namespace. So as long as you're willing to program in a certain style, uh, Barlamin might not be that bad. Um, you know, so... <laughs> Such a cute cat. Um, so, so that's actually one thing I want to play around with more is, okay, you know, let's... Uh, when I was playing around with the micro camera and stuff, I didn't really pay any attention to sort of namespace control. Um, you know, so what I should probably do is look at that again and try to figure out uh, if I were to put the helpers in LetRex, for example, you know, would that speed things up dramatically? I'm not sure. You know, we, we definitely need to improve the parser. There's no doubt because I found like it took like 30 seconds of, or you know, 20 some seconds of parsing time just to like load the file. With with like 200 lines of code, so that's like not acceptable, and and the error messages, you know, are not very helpful anyway. So uh, we need to fix that. Um, and I guess another question is like how 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 much code do we need to handle? How much of a language do we have to handle for it to be interesting or to to start being useful? You know, my guess is 200 lines of code is already pretty close uh, to being useful for this you know, Dan style research programming. You know, certainly if we got to like 500 lines of code, that would be plenty. You know, you could you could implement Mini Canrin and the relational interpreter together in 500 lines of code. So, you know, then you can really start doing serious experiments, you know, uh, at the research level for the sorts of things we do. Now, obviously, you're not going to write a 100,000 line scheme compiler like that. But, you know, you could, you could start doing some interesting things. So that's that's all I have to talk about. <laughs> Does anyone else want to talk about anything else, or uh, or we can we can stop the broadcast and hang out for a minute, and then I can get some pizza. Sounds good. Someone else wants some uh, pizza here. Kind of Hell yeah! <laughs> this is a very quiet sounding cat. Yeah. No, he. He doesn't make a lot of noise. He's just like insistent. He's kind of been all over me for the last few minutes. I mean, he's hungry. Does he give you a high five also? Yeah, that's his I'm hungry sign is that he tries to shake your hand. <laughs> yeah, and then all right. also his own kind of sitting in front of the computer slash on the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll stop the broadcast. If anyone wants to talk for a couple minutes afterwards, that's cool. And otherwise, we'll, we'll meet up soon. All right, bye.